Are we good? Yep. All right. Thank uh, you. All right. I'm sorry about that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, my presentation today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, need to let you know my daughter is currently uh, delivering a baby, so I'm I'm a little uh, scattered, but uh, nonetheless, I'm I'm really excited to be able to share this with you. So uh, so let's jump in. George Bernard Shaw once said, the, the most difficult thing, single most difficult thing about communication is the illusion that it has actually taken place. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's, that's pretty scary. Um, I just think about all the different times that I have uh, talked to people, and I'm sure you have too, uh, where things, you know, you think you've communicated, but you actually haven't. So um, why are you here today? I'm hoping that, um, you know, perhaps it's to get an answer, something happened that you find to be challenging, and uh, you're thinking maybe I, I can come up with some kind of an answer for you. Uh, I hope I can be helpful, absolutely. For me, the reason that I'm here is that I firmly believe that many of the conflicts faced in today's society would not have occurred if the strategies that we're gonna be talking about today had been implemented. This is kind of an unusual picture. It reminds me of uh, back when I was principaling the first staff meeting of the year, I, I'd always start off the same way. And I would ask teachers to stand and then point in any direction at all. And the result was something like this. And then I would ask, ask them to point at the clock that was over my head. And the resulting image was something like this. And then I would tell them, that's my job. My job is to get you all pointing in the same direction. My job is to work with you to move forward. And all of that was, was well and good. But the big question was, how are we going to do that? Hello, David. Sorry. Uh, just letting you know, we can see your notes. If you want, I can go ahead and share the presentation on my end. And Oh, you can see my notes. Yes, I, get, I'll go, I can go ahead and share the presentation on my end. You just let me know when to click to which slide, to the next slide. Does that work for you? Absolutely. I am on slide number five now. Perfect. I will go ahead and share. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, there we go. Okay. See, and I just lost my notes, but that's that's okay. Um all right, and now I'm having trouble moving to the next slide. I'll, I'll be making the slides. I'll move the slides for you. Oh, you'll move the slides. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. No problem. All right. So uh, my question was, how do we move people forward? Um, I've used a, a framework that I've developed that uh, I've used during challenging situations. It starts with the first component of think, and then we move to talk, and then act, and then sustain. Okay. So what I'd like to do today is to use a real life situation that uh, I encountered about 15 years ago, and how I use the framework. So, um, the negotiations were going on between the school board and the teachers union, and they were stalled. Tensions were mounting. I was the person in the middle as, as principal. Uh, we had a great staff, child-centered, uh, and we had a wonderfully supportive community. But now these groups were at odds. I was in the middle, didn't know what to do. So I went to the first component, which is to think. 
And what I'd like to do is, first of all, to challenge all of you, when you encounter a difficult situation, just pause, take a breath, and don't react, but think. Okay. How do we think under pressure? If we could just pause here, think about maybe a stressful time that you encountered and how did you think? Okay. I'm gonna suggest that there are two ways that we can think. First way is a technical approach and change slide please. Technical approach is one in which the problem is already defined. Uh, for example, somebody breaks their arm. Okay, so that's the problem. The answer is to take them to the hospital or to a doctor to get uh, the bone reset. When we have technical problems, we've identified what the problem is, and then we go, we can go to outside sources, we can go to experts, we can go to policy manuals, rule books, guidelines uh, to have the to have an answer readily available for us. Now that is all well and good, except when there's a challenging situation and there is no answer. There is no solution. And the problem is not defined. We call that adaptive. Next, please. So an adaptive approach to thinking. Think about racism. Think about all the different problems that we have and that do not have easy answers. Next. <clears throat> So an adaptive way of thinking is when people come together, stakeholders, people that are involved in the situation, and they work together to identify what the problem is. And once identified, then they work together to come up with a solution or solutions to that adaptive problem. Okay, next. So we just talked about uh, two strategies for thinking. One is technical. Technical approach, again, is where there is a problem that's defined and there are places that we can go outside of ourselves to find the answers. Adaptive is being able to recognize the fact that there are no easy answers to a problem that's out there. There are no solutions readily available and the people that are directly impacted, the stakeholders are the ones that need to work together to uh, come up with solutions. Okay. Now, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Could you reverse back to that last slide? <clears throat> Let's go back to the negotiations stalled negotiation contracts. I was the person in the middle and I had to think about what I was going to do. There are times for technical approaches, absolutely. But sometimes, sometimes there aren't. I turned to an adaptive way of thinking about this problem as I met with different members of the uh, teacher teams and then I met separately with different members of the school community. And uh, from that, I listened to, uh, to what they had to say about the situation. Okay. All right, talk. How in the world do we talk to one another? Have you ever been in a situation where you're in conversation, then all of a sudden there is just you don't know what to say. And there's an awkward pause and people fidget and maybe they leave. Um, but talking can be awkward. Next. There are two ways of talking. The first way that I wanna to talk to you about is through discussion. Now discussion is the, next slide please. 
is the gateway to decision making. Something I'd like to also point out is that the word discussion is oftentimes uh, used as a synonym for dialogue, for exchange, for talk. What I'm gonna suggest to you, and I, I think is very, very important, is that discussion should be called what it is. And that is the gateway to decision-making. If you are talking to somebody and your talk is not gonna end up in a decision-making uh, venue, you are not in discussion, you're talking. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So when people discuss, they come together to share ideas, to share their thoughts, and hopefully reach consensus. And all of that is well and good. That said, sometimes there are people in discussion that will dominate the conversation. They don't listen, they talk. And the other people in the group oftentimes feel intimidated and uh, reticent to share what they're thinking. When that happens, um, the group really loses out. We're trying to develop collective IQ and it's tough to develop collective IQ when there are members of the group that are afraid to talk. So what do we do? We have to move to the second way of talking, which is, we could change, which is dialogue. Next slide. Dialogue is an intentional effort to create safe spaces with, uh, with the group that's, that's there. The environment is non-judgmental, it's safe. People can really share what they have to say because they know that they're not gonna be judged. It's a time where they can collect more information about um, whatever the issue is. Uh, just a, a quick example from my principal days. We used to meet a lot about uh, when we would change a curriculum. And so people would come together and they would talk about their, their thoughts and feelings with that in an effort to come to consensus. But we did have times where um, people would tend to dominate the discussion. And so either myself or a member of the staff would say, can we move back to dialogue? And when dialogue occurred, we were able to collect the information that we needed in order to send it back to discussion. So it's a fluid arrangement. It's a fluid way to talk. Decisions are not made in a, a dialogue framework. Okay. So we just finished talking about discussion and dialogue. Uh, discussion is the gateway to decision-making. Dialogue in that form of conversation, it's not about decision-making, it's about creating a safe environment for people to talk judgment-free so people can collect the information they need to be able to go back into a discussion framework in order to make a decision. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you go back, please? <clears throat> so I want to take us back to the stalled negotiation uh, contract. Discussion definitely has its place. It has its time. We have to make decisions about things. We cannot talk and talk and talk and never arrive at a decision. So discussion definitely has its place. For this particular situation, I chose to go into dialogue. Dialogue uh, enabled me to talk in a, in a safe environment with teachers and then with uh, the families of, of students in order to uh, listen for common concerns. What were they concerned about? Um, and we were able to ascertain that kind of uh, response from them in the dialogue phase 
of talk. Okay. Now, all of that is well and good. The, the strategies that we talked about in thinking and in talking. But we all know that if we don't put our inspiration into action, actually acting, our efforts are likely to go nowhere. That brings us to our third component, which is act. Okay, so act by definition is not a passive endeavor at, at all. It implies movement, either physical or movement in, in the brain. Okay. As before, there are two ways that we can act. We can act by taking a position. So we act on our position. Next. So when uh, we are stating our position, we're stating our views, we're stating our opinions, we're stating what is deemed to be true in the eye of the beholder. And all of that is great. We have to sometimes take a position because if we don't stand for something, then we stand for nothing. So position definitely has its time and its place. Having said that, sometimes we run into a, a situation where someone's position actually is a detriment because they don't open their mind, they don't open their hearts to uh, new ways of thinking. And as a result, they don't grow and, um, and they're, they're stuck. So what do we do in a situation like that? Okay. We have to move into finding out what the needs of other people are and our own needs before we act. We have to listen, really listen to people to find out what they need. We have to listen to ourselves to find out what we need. And then we need to listen for common language, common interests. Next. Now, I know this isn't a presentation about Maslow, uh, but I really can't talk about human needs unless I uh, talk about human physiological needs, safety needs, love and belonging, all of those different needs that as we're talking to people, we need to listen for and then be sure that the needs and interests of, of both parties are being taken into account and acted on, and then we are much more likely to end up with a solution that is productive. Okay. So thinking about the differences when we act between position and needs, both of these are important. When we act on our position, we act on what we believe to be true, our views, uh, our experiences that have gone into the position that we've taken. However, sometimes there's a different way of acting and that is when we are serious about listening to the needs and the interests of the other people that are involved and from there listening for common ground when we are coming up with a solution to the problem. All right, now back to contract negotiations. I had, first of all, done some thinking, decided to use an adaptive approach. I decided to be in dialogue with the, with the people that were um, involved. And then based on that, I needed to act. I heard as uh, I was continuing these conversations with people that what the need was, the common ground was to get the kids back into the classroom. So the teachers had said that, the, uh, the families and the community had said that. So I leveraged that 
when I chose to act. And I wrote a letter. Now, I'm not going to read the whole letter to you, but I did pull a short paragraph out of it, which I think kind of summarizes what the intent of the letter was. And I'd just like to uh, quickly read that to you. It says, my challenge for all of us is to continue to work as a team in doing what is best for our students. These are extraordinary times, and my expectation for all of us is to reach a little deeper and be respectful of others' thoughts and feelings. Obviously, at some point, the contract will be settled. When this occurs, we will all be working together and will have a choice in determining the type of school climate in which our students learn. Now, I got lots of uh, positive feedback. Everybody said, oh, that was, that was a really nice letter. And, and I was glad about that. But I didn't really have any way to know if the letter was going to help. So with that in mind, I went to the fourth component. Next. All right. So everything was just fine and dandy, right? After, after the letter? Wrong. It wasn't. Next. I needed to implement a component that is so often forgotten in strategic planning initiatives of, of different organizations. And that component is, next, to sustain the momentum of the initiative. That has to be built in. Next. It's the difference between an opportunity that's taken. In other words, the new initiative that has been put together, a solution that has been put together, it's an opportunity to be taken if sustainability is built into the plan or this new opportunity that uh, has been uh, out there is gonna be missed. It's gonna be missed if sustainability is not part of the plan and the people who are naysayers about the new initiative or the solution are gonna be saying, see, I told you, I told you that wouldn't work. Next. There are lots of different ways to sustain uh, the initiative or to sustain the momentum of a, of a new initiative. I wanna to talk to you about three though. Uh, three that I have used and, and had success with. So the first, the first uh, way to maintain the momentum is to create professional relationships. Think about uh, when you buy a car, perhaps you have a salesperson that, uh, that you trust, or you're buying furniture, you have a salesperson you're trusting. Next. So for you, what does that mean? That means that you take the initiative to continue building and maintaining these professional relationships with the stakeholders that, that you were working with. Uh, you're limited only by your creativity. Next. Okay, the second way that you can sustain your momentum is the plan, do, check, act cycle. Uh, notice that the plan, do, check, act is in red, and it's in red for a, a very specific reason, which we'll talk about in a moment. Next. Maybe the best way to explain this cycle is to um, talk to you about what I did while I was principaling at a school. The plan part involved getting together in mid-May generally with the leadership team and coming up with plans to improve our school for the following school year. In order to do that, we looked at 
a lot of student data and school data. We looked at uh, academics and we disaggregated the data by, by gender, by race, um, by behavior, all sorts of different ways. We looked at who was being successful and who was not. And from there, we created our, uh, our targets for the following school year. Then we went to the do part. Now, do is actually implementing the plans that we had created in May. And uh, so we implemented those. And when the students came back in the fall, in order to see how we were doing, we had to not wait until the whole school year was over um, because by then the damage would already be done. We needed to monitor how we were doing. So we had both informal and formal assessments during the course of the year. And the quick one that I'll tell you about now, is the big check was in about mid-January after the uh, first semester was over. We re-looked at student data and we looked at how the students that we were targeting, how were they doing? Were they doing well? Were they not doing so well? Did the plan that we came up with actually work or did we need to tweak it? Usually we needed to do some tweaking, which we did. And then we went to the to the fourth part of this framework, which is acting. So then we would implement uh, those things that, that we had tweaked in addition to the, the regular school improvement plan. And then I called this cyclical because then we were back to planning and we just repeated the whole process again. We got the leadership team together in mid-May. We looked at student data school data, and then we, we uh, created our plan for the following school year, and then the cycle just repeated itself. Okay, next. Third way of sustaining your momentum is the inquiry method. Change, please. When we use the inquiry method, we need to think about who our stakeholders are and how are we getting feedback from them during the course of the year. So we did lots of informal, uh, we presented lots of informal experiences for, for our uh, school families. Uh, we had Friday morning coffees uh, where family members could come in and have coffee and a bagel. Uh, sometimes we didn't even talk about school, uh, but sometimes we did. It gave them an opportunity to voice their concerns, their questions, their suggestions. It was, it was really an excellent, safe way for, for them to do that. Next. All right. So the three ways that we just talked about for sustaining the momentum creating and maintaining professional relationships, plan, do, check, act, uh, cycle, and inquiry method. Now, I mentioned to you that uh, the plan, do, check, act was in red. The reason for that is that in my mind, plan, do, check, act is a technical way of thinking because it's something that we can go to that has a very definite, very definite four parts. The other uh, two ways are both great also, but perhaps there's more chance to think adaptively here because organizations are all different. And so you can't really come up with a standard way to maintain professional relationships because what works in one organization may not work in another. And the same way for inquiry method. Uh, thinking about your stakeholder group, you know, they're all going to be different and you're, again, limited only by your creativity. Next. So I was excited about the title of this uh, presentation, Creating a Culture of Safety and the Free Flow of Information. And one thing 
<laughs> that really stuck with me is that transitions occur over time and they're not a single event. Um, I was really excited once um, when a teacher said, and I'll tell you what the teacher said in just a second, um, remembering transitions occur over time and are not an event. One way that we do that is to celebrate. We celebrate uh, success when, when things happen. Um, I had a, a little moment of uh, celebration for myself and, and the staff when early on uh, in my tenure at, at this school as principal, one of the teachers asked when we were having one of these curriculum conversations, are we in dialogue or are we in, tran or are we in dialogue or are we in discussion? And I thought, wow, that's, that's a big deal. They're starting to use the language, starting to uh, understand the value and they just open the gate for other teachers who may be wondering the same thing but uh, were afraid to say anything. So, you know, it, it became used more and more um, throughout my tenure at that school. Choose courage over comfort. This isn't always easy. Leadership is not easy. It's rewarding. It can be, I just so much enjoyed my time um, as a school administrator. There were moments, of course, but overall, I really enjoyed it. But one of the things that um, I especially enjoyed were those times of challenge and being able to work together with people to uh, come out with successful outcomes. And sometimes you just had to be uncomfortable. You just had to be uncomfortable. And finally, uh, rumble with vulner vulnerable, vulnerability. Vulnerability. Uh, that's from Brene, Brene uh, Brown. Uh, many of you are familiar with, with her. And sometimes when we do this work, we're gonna be a little ragged. We're gonna be a little ragged and that's okay. That's okay. Uh, you know, that's it's a tough way to be if you're always right. Uh, so sometimes we're going to be ragged and we've got to go with it and, and understand that it's part of uh, the process. And I believe that kind of brings us to the end of, of what I have here. So I'm wondering if uh, there are questions and I, I would uh, definitely like to take those. All right, I do see that there is one, uh, there is one question from Tracy and she says, how do you get to dialogue if there is no culture of safety and the leader is the one preventing safety in discussion? Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, so I, I really heard two questions. I, I heard one regarding um, the group and maybe the group isn't receptive to dialogue. And then I heard another question about um, the leader himself or herself. So um, let's deal with the, with the group first of all. When doing that, if you have a leader who has, who has bought into this notion of discussion versus dialogue, the leader himself or herself can um, encourage that kind of conversation by modeling. So maybe the organization isn't at the point where you have specifically named it, i.e. we're in dialogue right now, but you're asking those kinds of questions, you're creating a safe zone, you're very aware of the process that, uh, that you are implementing and the language that you're using is such that uh, people are, are feeling safe knowing that other people will not have a chance to uh, overrun the conversations. It does take a skilled facilitator. I'm not, I'm not saying that it doesn't, but once it's established that this is how we are going to operate, 
then again, it doesn't change overnight, but transition occurs over time. And frankly, you may lose people. When I went to this school um, where um, I took several examples and shared them with you, there were staff people that left. There were staff people that left and that was okay. I spent 13 years at that school and I can tell you by the time that I left, I was feeling really good about where the school was, about the ownership that uh, the staff had taken in not only staff, but the community had taken in um, you know, this type of, of thinking. And we had, we had a true team. We had a true team, which is one reason why I think we bounced back relatively quickly from, um, I was talking to you about the, the uh, contract being stalled out. Um, and, you know, we overcame and we're back on pretty solid ground afterwards. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I know that some other schools weren't, there were still hard feelings. As far as the leader, um, that, that's a tough one. And I've been there and so I feel, I feel your pain. Uh, I know there have been a couple of situations where I have been in an environment like that. And I had to ask myself the question, <clears throat> is this a place where I can be? And quite frankly, um, there were a couple of times where I needed to leave. Absolutely. Because it was very important that my belief system coordinated well with the, with the environment that I was going to be in and lead. So that's, that is an option, um, but it's not always an option for, for everybody. So if you have a leader who um, is toxic in that way and not willing to create safe environments for people, then my experience has been that sometimes I need to model that for them. I need to set up a meeting. I need to go in and some of those things that, that we talked about, um, listening to understand, um, you know, finding out what the leader's needs are by saying things like, how can I be helpful here? I noticed that this was going on. You know, what, what could I do? How could I be a part of that? Now, sometimes that works. It, as I said before, uh, that would be a transition and it wouldn't happen overnight, but it can happen. It, it does happen. I've seen people move from uh, A to B. Uh, you know, I, it's awkward to ask a question like, have you ever thought some, did you ever think something uh, in your earlier life and you don't think that anymore? Uh, so, you know, I, I would not recommend that you necessarily put that question to somebody in those words, but the concept, did, have you ever changed your mind? I can think for myself early on in my administrative career uh, my view of uh, children with special needs and, and what kind of environment they needed for learning was way different than where I am now, way different. I have changed my mind completely. So again, it's uh, sometimes you yourself need to model the behavior, to ask questions that, that really delve and um, Hopefully something happens there. If not, you know, the finding something else can always be an option. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Um, I do not see any other questions. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, take this time to thank you so much for your time today and for everything that you've taught us. Um, and then for everyone else that has been with us in this journey for today, for this hour, uh, thank you for being here.
Uh, here at Dream Bank, we truly believe in the power of dreams and celebrate that our community is made up of fearless dreamers. As we wrap up, actually, uh, we always like to ask our speakers one last question, and that is, what is one piece of advice that you have for someone pursuing a, who is pursuing a dream right now? I think, um, first of all, patience and understand that it's not going to happen overnight. It's it's going to be a long time in the making. This particular presentation today, I've, I've spent years on, it's evolved, um, but patience for sure. Um, and feeling like what you're doing is very important because I have uh, seen so many situations happen that uh, did not have a good outcome and because I have thought, you know, that really didn't need to happen. If these people would have used dialogue during their conversations, uh, if they would have thought in an adaptive way, be because you can't, you can't use technical thinking in an adaptive situations. And a lot of times that happens. So anyway, um, just having these skills available whether it's uh, working in an organization or relationships with each other uh, is, is very important. So patience, commitment, and a, feel, a feeling like, you know, this is, this is important work. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And to all who tuned in, uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to continuing to learn, grow, and dream together. Uh, you can learn more about upcoming DreamBank events and content design with your dreams in mind at amfem.com slash DreamBank and by connecting with us on our social channels. On behalf of American Family Insurance and DreamBank, we look forward to hosting you again soon. Until then, keep dreaming fearlessly and thank you so much. Bye. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.